Welcome, welcome. Good morning, everybody. I'm filling in for Harry because that's one of my announcements this morning. Harry, our Harry is not here. And we are, we're sad to that. Harry's feeling under the weather. Carol, you have any, he's, he's not feeling well. He'll be back. He'll be back. Uh, He'll I think be. I've been left over. <laughs> he ate too many leftovers. <laughs> yes. Uh, are there any announcements? Anyone has announcements? Maggie? I'm here to announce. Don't forget the Christmas parade. Christmas which parade. Which is the first Saturday in December, which is only a couple weeks away. I will be riding in the DAR float, which will be a boat celebrating the Boston Tea Party. <laughs> but since I can't get into the boat, I will be sitting up front in the truck with the driver. <laughs> but anyway, come to the parade, enjoy it with all the, the Christmas. What festivities. what time does it begin, Maggie? I'm sorry. What time does it begin? Do you know? It begins, I think, at 6 or 6.30. That would be p.m., right? <laughs> and, of course. Uh, and it goes until it's over. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. And as I recall, the last of the parade is actually leaving the school grounds, and the first of the parade is already returning when the last is still leaving. So this is three miles long. And there's a lot of floats in it. Mm -hmm. Good. So please remember it. Okay. Thank you. Any other announcements? Well, with that, we're going to begin. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let we us rejoice, rejoice and be glad in it. Please stand and welcome the Holy Spirit. pray. Lord, indeed, we recognize that we are wasting our time if you are not present with us. If all this is is the convocation of fellowship of humans, then we are indeed falling short. And so I pray that, Lord, indeed, you will fill our hearts and our lives with the awareness of your presence in this place this morning and that lord you will move among us we know that we will worship you in truth because we are preaching your word and your word is truth but all is vain unless the spirit of the holy one comes down and so we pray indeed holy spirit that you will move among us now and that you will guide our worship so that what is lifted up before you in praise and thanksgiving will be pleasing to you. Father, thank you now for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we have asked it. Amen. Let us be called to worship responsibly. Arise, people of God, to receive the Lord's messenger. Be reminded of our covenant with the living God. God has done great things for us. We are partakers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
The messenger of God reminds us of promises made and of good work not yet completed. We are redefined and refined in the fires of God's love and purified to carry forward God's intent. We dedicate this hour and we, he, God will lead us in all times and places. God is with us here to bless and confront. We dedicate this hour of worship to God's glory opening ourselves to a true encounter with the eternal. Amen. Let us worship the Lord together in song. You'll find our hymn of praise this morning on page number 561 in your hymnals. 561. We gather together a traditional Thanksgiving hymn. Although Thanksgiving was Thursday, we still give thanks every day. Let's celebrate that Thanksgiving. We gather together. question in seminary we gathered together how can you gather separately <laughs> let us be called to confession who are those who trample on the poor build ever larger houses and provide for their own comfort and security as if these things were central to life who turns away from the truth when its implications are costly, who practices deceit or utters lies, through your own words or in the words we say together, confess your guilt to God so self-centeredness and selfishness ceases. Let us have just a brief moment of silent prayer. Would you share with me now our prayer of confession? O oh God, we have turned your justice to wormwood and betrayed the very people you have called us to help. We enjoy the fruits of others' labors without giving them just compensation. We pursue arrogant power to keep our privileges and practice deceit to gain our own ends. Save us, we pray, from our poor choices, our willful disobedience, and our unconscious denial of your way. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Hear the good word of our Lord. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
God looks with favor on the faithful in the land. In Jesus Christ, death is abolished and life and immortality are brought to light. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. We are saved by God's grace, not by our works, but what we do testifies to God's redeeming love within us. Let us receive with joy the gift of forgiveness, being empowered thereby to sing new songs of praise and thanksgiving. Let us now celebrate our forgiveness by singing the Gloria Patri. Please stand for Gloria Patri and remain standing for the Apostles' Creed. share together in our confession this morning. It is found out of number 716 toward the back of your hymnals. Church, what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, this is the point where Harry asked for prayer requests, our joys and concerns we share together. Any, does anybody have any joys or concerns? Ask, yes, Pat. Uh, most of the Northside people will, will uh, know this young lady who just had her first baby boy, Albion Johnson, Heidi's daughter. Oh. She and her husband are now parents, and they're living down in... Uh, where Oliver is, is he's going to law school, but they had a baby boy. So Heidi's grandson. Heidi is now a grandmother. Heidi's a grandmother. Yeah. Oh, grandmother. bless her heart. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if she feels any different. <laughs> any other any other announcements? I mean, excuse me, joys or concerns. No, everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving so much you're stuffed, right? Just like the turkey, can't talk. Well, I would ask that we, that we pray especially for our, our nation and give thanks for the founding fathers who gave us a great republic. Now, let's just hold on to that and pray that we can do that. Uh, any, any other? Announcements? Okay, Pastor. Thank you. I asked Angela if she'd fill in there because she always hears better than I do. And so why get it secondhand from her when she can just get it to start with and talk, tell me, you know. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Lord, we're so grateful we can come to you and we can know that you hear us when we pray because unlike some of us, you're not hard of hearing. And you're also not hard of listening because your heart is always open to your children. And we're so grateful for that. We're so grateful for your many promises and your word, chief among them, being that if we will humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, and then you will hear from heaven and you will forgive our sin and you will heal our land. And so we are so grateful for that, Lord. And I pray that uh, you will indeed touch our land with a new birth of repentance and renewal and that refreshing will come from the very throne of heaven to refresh our spirits and challenge us and, and cheer our hearts and inspire us to new depths of commitment in the years ahead. Now, Father, I thank you that you're always willing to receive us when we stray from the way. And we pray that you will touch any soul who may be participating with us at home, that they will also hear the call of forgiveness and that they will cry out to you for your healing mercy and for your saving mercy as well. And Lord, we're so grateful that we can come to you at the time like this so that we may pray that prayer that you, our Master, have taught us with all courage and all boldness. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And it reminds me that part of our negotiation this morning was that I would do the offering. Invitation. <laughs> oh, let us come to this time of giving, not out of guilt, but in anticipation of the good we can do through those whom we help. May our tithes and our offerings and our lives bear testimony to the purposes of God revealed in our Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we have prospered, so each of us, let us give cheerfully. And we're so grateful and so blessed to have Brenda today to sing our offertory for us while we give. Ooh. 
Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Would you please stand for the doxology? <clears throat> Praise God. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, I don't have to ask, but uh, did everybody get enough turkey and dressing and all the fixings? Thursday. Well, we actually tried it a little bit different this uh, year. We, uh, since uh, one of our children was not going to be able to be with us, he and his fiancee were down visiting a grandparents in Tuscaloosa. We had uh, kind of just a leisurely Thanksgiving breakfast uh, on Thursday, uh, which really was just a normal breakfast and just hung out and visited with our family from Charlotte. And, uh, and that meant that they did not have to spend all the day uh, cooking to get ready for the big meal. And then the next day, we did all of that. So we celebrated Thanksgiving a day late, I guess, you know, but uh, had a wonderful time together, a wonderful time of fellowship. And I know you, however your tradition is, uh, I imagine that you did, as I said, have plenty of turkey and all the trimmings and the dressing. Uh, cornbread dressing is my favorite. Uh, the, uh, but you do kind of get a little tired of turkey sandwiches and turkey casserole and turkey, whatever, everything but turkey a la mode, I guess. But uh, uh, so what inspired me to this message? I got to take a little bit of time to build on this, I guess, to say, I want to think about, is Jesus our Passover lamb? He said, we just got through talking about turkey and Thanksgiving and all of this. Because you see, I think that there's a tie-in with thanksgiving and let's see if i can explore that thesis with you this morning i, re I remember back uh, a couple of years ago when we were up in the berkshires on vacation we went to the norman rockwell museum and uh, he is one of my favorite artists because he just paints american americana it's just absolutely beautiful to see the work he has done and one of his uh, collections there in this huge uh, gallery that is just a museum all to itself for Rockwell are the Four Freedoms. You remember the Four Freedoms that Roosevelt talked about? The freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom from want, and the freedom from fear. 
and uh, Rockwell painted his version of what each of those freedoms meant. And it's most impressive. And the freedom from want is the family sitting down to Thanksgiving dinner and a big old turkey with a full table and everything to eat. So someone has said we celebrate our prosperity uh, that we have all we want to eat uh, by trying to eat all of it on Thanksgiving, you know. Well, let's look at the history of Thanksgiving then for just a minute to, to establish this tie-in, I believe, with the Passover. When did the first Thanksgiving dinner occur? Well, uh, that's easy. Any school child knows that. It was in 1621 at Plymouth, right? Well, let's see if we can explore history a little bit more, boys and girls. In 1619, 35 English settlers uh, led by John Woodliffe came to Virginia, and the Virginia Company informed them that the day they arrived in the colonies would be declared as a yearly holiday, as a day of thanksgiving to Almighty God. This would mean that they celebrated Thanksgiving a year before the pilgrims. But we can go even further back. In 1578, a group of Englishmen led by Martin Frobisher explored Canada on the coast of Labrador. And uh, when you explored uh, coast and things like that back then, you had to do it in ships. And, and they ran into a huge storm and uh, they thought they were going to just be des destroyed, but they survived. And so when they came ashore, they had their own Thanksgiving service and celebration. In 1564, though, even earlier, a group of French Huguenots settled near Jacksonville, Florida, and they had a service of Thanksgiving. But this didn't please everybody. King Philip II of Spain, who said, what are the French doing in our Spanish territory, uh, ordered an expedition to dispel the French from Florida. After enduring a hurricane, the group opted out on just simply founding the city of St. Augustine in 1565. And we never heard much more about what they tried to do with the, with the uh, French. But the admiral leading the expedition invited the local Native American population to a feast, and a priest conducted a worship service. This was in 1564. So I hope I didn't ruin anything for you about the pilgrims because I love the fact that they survived as well. And if you have never read a wonderful book, read the book, The Light and the Glory by Peter Marshall. He will tell you uh, wonderful bits of information about the uh, pilgrims that perhaps you didn't know. I know I certainly didn't know them. And uh, just, I think you'll be blessed by that. But does that mean that 1564 was the earliest Thanksgiving meal? No, I don't think so. I think probably the greatest Thanksgiving meal in world history was celebrated 1300 BCE. Does anyone have an idea of what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the Passover. And I want to invite your attention to Exodus, the 12th chapter. And we will look at Exodus, the 12th chapter. And I believe we will see uh, the birth of the Passover in terms of what the uh, uh, Passover meant to the children of Israel. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, 
This month shall be to you the beginning of months. In other words, this is going to be so new for you and then for Israel that this is going to be considered the, the, a whole new year because you're going to have a whole new life. And so this month shall be to you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak unto the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month you shall take every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household is too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house Take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Now let's read a little bit about this lamb. Well, first of all, let's talk a little bit about the Passover, or as it is called today in the Jewish faith, the Passover Pesach Seder, or Seder. The time, as we said, was 430 years after Israel had entered Egypt. The place was Goshen, Egypt, and God had sent plagues upon the people of Egypt because of their sin against the people of Israel in making them their slaves. And then let's look at the threat, the threat. God is about to release a final plague upon Egypt. And it will be so severe that the firstborn of every family in Egypt will die. Does that sound pretty severe? Not only of the people, but of the livestock the firstborn will die. It will be not only agony and weeping all over Egypt, but it will be an absolute destruction of their economy. How will Israel avoid this same destruction, this same death angel? Have you ever seen uh, Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments? That past, that time when they are gathering and then you see this like a hand coming down from the heavens and there's like a green fog like that comes off of it and it just begins to spread all over the ground and, and uh, it, it is just like the death angel has come to Egypt. I don't know how more dramatic you could make it than that other than actually witnessing it yourself for the first time but or for that for that been a part of the original Passover. But I want us to remember something about that lamb this morning. We've talked a little bit about the Passover. <laughs> We've talked about how it is going to be a meal that is going to be celebrated and it is going to be a meal of deliverance, liberation, and salvation for the children of Israel. So let's see, first of all, the prophetic purpose of the Lamb. The Lamb. Moses is told, that you shall take a lamb, a lamb for a house, that it will, there will be provision. Everyone who needs to have some of that lamb will get some of the lamb. Now, in other words, it's not going to just be one lamb, it's going to be a lamb for a house. There's going to be lambs slaughtered all over uh, Goshen, a lamb for a house. And not only is there provision, 
But if you know me, you know I like to use alliteration. We're going to remember it by P's, okay? Provision, purity. What must this lamb be? This lamb shall be without blemish. Purity. And now there's preference. What kind of lamb shall it be? Does it matter if it's male or female? Apparently it did to God. It shall be a male. So there's preference. And then, look at verse 5. He says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Think about peers. Jesus, how did he come into the world? On a throne that came down from heaven and like a extraterrestrial or something moment? No. He came as a babe born in the manger and grew up among his peers. In a little bit, we're going to connect. In fact, you're probably already connecting the dots. Is anybody seeing a connection with Jesus here? First of all, he is adequate for the salvation of the whole world. That is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that the whole world is offered salvation. Is there any purer than the Lord Jesus Christ who is without sin? Is he a male? Absolutely. And you shall take this and you shall uh, keep it. It said, you should, the lamb you shall be without blemish, a male of the what? The first year. A one-year-old lamb was in his prime. It was, the lamb had proven itself to be strong and healthy and a survivor. And it was during his prime that his life will be taken. When did Jesus die? Somewhere around 33. Who comes from his peers and who is taken and you shall keep the lamb and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. In other words, you're, you're going to set it out on the 10th day and you're going to watch it for four days until the 14th day you're going to look it over and make sure that there is absolutely no impurity, blemish, or defect in this lamb. In other words, the lamb is proven. Proven. And then the lamb is, here's another P, presented. The lamb is presented to the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel. And everyone will take all their lambs and they will gather somewhere in a large central area where thousands of lambs can be slaughtered at the same time and all the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Was Jesus killed before the whole congregation of Israel? Jerusalem? Yes, he was. Was he proven? Yes. He lived and ministered for three years. Everyone knew exactly what he preached. And they also saw how wonderfully he lived. So that he is, anyone would say he is the only one that ever lived a perfect life without sin. Okay, we've looked at the prophetic purpose of the Lamb, and that is that the Lamb is going to have a special responsibility. It is, it is to die, but by its death, salvation will be brought 
to Israel. But in order for this salvation to occur, there has to be a placement of the blood. So let's look at that placement. Verse 7. And you shall take of the blood, and you shall strike it on the two side posts, and on the upper post of the houses, wherein you shall eat the lamb. So, the first thing is you shall apply the blood. Has anybody heard that old hymn, There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name? Is the blood of Jesus placed or applied? Indeed, it is. So there's a placement of the blood. And not only just you, should you put it any, on any place in your town, but you should place it on the houses wherein you will be eating the lamb. Because then when the death angel comes down and he sees the blood, what is he going to do? He's going to pass over that house. Hence the term Passover. So you have the prophetic nature of the lamb, you have the placement of the blood, but now you have the partaking of the lamb. You're not, you're not going to offer this lamb as a burnt sacrifice. You're not going to kill the lamb and then just simply burn up every part of the lambs out there in this big area. But now you're going to bring the lamb home and you're going to roast the lamb and the partaking of the lamb we looked at the prophetic nature of the lamb the placement of the blood now let us look at the partaking of the lamb how are you going to partake how are you going to uh, prepare the lamb and how are you going to eat the lamb well you're not going to prepare it uh, you're not by boiling it you're not going to boil the meat. You're not going to separate all the meat. You're going to roast the whole lamb, the head, the legs, the whole nine yards. You're going to roast the whole lamb. And uh, this is something I keep saying because it's very f familiar to us when we talk about the lamb. One of the things was that the lamb could be taken from among the sheep or among the goats. So what does that mean? That means that if the family didn't have sheep, they could offer a kid. But it would be a male kid. So you're going to take your lamb or your kid you're going to roast it whole and then you're going to eat the lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And there's some prohibitions here. This is how serious this meal is. It is not to be boiled. It is to have no water on it whatsoever. It is not to be consumed raw. It is to be completely prepared. And then along with these prohibitions, there is this perfection mentioned that none of it will be wasted. You're not going to uh, throw out one piece of this animal. Everybody in your house is going to eat everything but the bones, basically, I guess. All eaten. And the, what you don't eat, well, I guess he does give a little bit here to say you don't have to eat every bit of the animal. You will burn anything that's left over. It will be a consecrated burnt offering to the Lord. Now, how shall you eat this meal? How did Israel eat this meal? Prepared to go. 
if we're going to eat uh, the uh, Eucharist, how do we partake of the Eucharist? Are we relaxed and seated, you know, usually comfortably? This is how you had to celebrate the Passover according to the instruction to Moses and Aaron. With your loins girt up, And let's go on and, and just read the words here. And verse 8, And they shall eat the flesh of, in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat it not raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remains until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. You shall eat it quickly. Does it, why do you want to do that? Because you're eating a meal in faith, saying what? I'm ready to leave this place. Do you think Israel was eager to get out of Egypt? Or you better believe they were. So the last thing that, the, the last messages rather that is given to us in this meal is that not only shall you eat it prepared to go, but you shall eat it properly. It is the Lord's Passover. It said you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. In other words, this is not just a cutesy meal, folks. God is present in this meal. And because you're going to do what he has instructed you to do, because you're going to be obedient to the word and partake of it the way he has told you to partake of the lamb, and you're going to apply the blood as he has told you to, then the death angel, when he comes and he sees the blood, he will pass over your house and then also he will provide a means of escape for you. So partake of it, ready to go properly. It is the Lord's Passover. And here's another word, permanence. It is a memorial forever. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. God is speaking in the form of his death angel. The death angel will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt and this day shall be unto you for a memorial and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord for how long throughout your generations you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever And now you're going to get into some of the prohibitions. It says, seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Is God treating this meal like it's serious? He's treating it like it's very serious on the first night. And he's also treating it like it's very serious for the generations to come. 
And in the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done on these holy days, save that which every man must eat that only may be done of you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in the selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Now, why did I take the time to talk about Passover? Because of the connection. Because 1,300 years later, give or take a few years, Jesus is only ours from the cross. And He is gathering with His disciples to celebrate Passover. Jesus called it the Passover. He said, with a great desire, a great passion, I have wanted to celebrate this Passover with you. Well, what about, what does John call Jesus in John 1.29? He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What are the elements then in this Passover that Jesus uses? The elements of bread. And he says, this is my body. And the elements of wine, he says, this is my blood. Well, where's the lamb in the Passover? He's breaking the bread and lifting the cup. Well, we've looked at the question, does Jesus meet the requirements of the Passover lamb? I would say a resounding yes. And how does the Eucharist compare with Passover? The same elements? Without any doubt, without going into all the details of a Seder meal, and I, I have... Uh, some preparation here that I can do that, but I'm probably going to run out of time, and so I probably won't do that. But can we regard the Eucharist like the Passover, then, as our last question, as a meal of liberation or salvation? When Israel celebrates the Passover, I'm told that they relive it. The youngest that is able to either read or, or speak legibly, legibly, speak in, articulately enough to say, why is this meal different than all other meals? Why is this night different from all other nights? And the oldest will reply, because on this night, our God delivered us from the hands of the Egyptians. Not 3,000 years ago, 3,300 years ago, but on this night. I would pray we would take that same freshness into communion when we celebrate Holy Communion together. When we celebrate the Eucharist, by the way, the word Eucharist in the Greek is Eucharisto, to give thanks, or to have thanksgiving. The youngest child, why is this night different? And then the child will ask a second question. Why do we eat bitter herbs and not vegetables? And then a third question. Why do we dip these bitter herbs Twice, once in salt water and once in charoseth, or sweet sauce. And then why do we all recline? That's an interesting question. And the oldest will answer those questions. Why is this night different? I've already told you. 
Why do we eat bitter herbs and not vegetables? Because of the bitterness of our servitude in Egypt. Why do we dip these bitter herbs, uh, parsley in this case, once in salt water? Because the salt water represents the tears of our people from their bondage. But then we dip it in the charasup, which is the sweet sauce made with apples, grapes, and cinnamon, because it reminds us that even out of the greatest bitterness can come the greatest sweetness when we have hope in the Lord. One theologian that I read that was a Jewish theologian said, why the four questions? And why is the Seder divided into four parts? Because if you read Exodus 6, 6 through 7, and I will read it for you just real quickly. 6, 6 through 7 says, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. In other words, I will take you out of Egypt. I will deliver you. And then he says, and I will rid you of their bonds. I will save you. I will separate you from being in bondage. And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. I will redeem you. I will pay the price for you. And I will make you a great nation. In verse 7 it says, And I will take you to be for a people, and I will be to you God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. We need to pray for Israel, not just because there's a war going on between them and their enemies now, but because once a year they celebrate this wonderful Passover Seder and they do not see the Passover lamb. I hope in this brief time together we've been able to get a better look at that Passover lamb and what Jesus has done for us and that we could not do for ourselves. He has taken upon himself our sins. Surely he has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Let us stand together and let us sing our song of dedication. As we give praise for God's sacrifice of his son on the cross, let's stand and sing our closing hymn, page 527 in your hymnals, Glory to His Name.
receive the benediction. Lord, send us forth now as your servants who have been instructed in your word, who know the truth of your great revelation to the children of Israel in the Passover and in Christ Jesus, our Passover lamb. Send us forth now as your ambassadors of grace, mercy, and peace, as your agents of salt and light. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior and Master, amen. And God be with you till we meet again. <laughs> forth in peace to love and serve the Lord.